language in the story of Band-Aid. 20 years ago, a super group of the most famous pop stars of the 80s got together to record the song that they hoped would make a difference. So we were completely the odd ones out. We were like the bastard children of the clash who actually believed that music could change the world. It's Christmas time. It was just, it was just a one-off thing. That one, and it was, it was just very, very special. At Christmas time, we, we land in light and we banish shade. And then it was... That was it? It was the first time anything like that had ever happened. And to be part of the first one is very special for us. Everyone bought the record, even if they didn't like it. At Christmas time. I mean, that bit was quite heavy. It's like, you know, push it. <laughs> Do they know it's Christmas time? The record was a reaction to horrific news reports from famine devastated Ethiopia. Of Africans are struggling to survive. The worst human disaster. Seven for a million day. people are threatened by starvation. It lights up a biblical famine. I don't think it should ever make us cynical and, and say, we, "Oh well, it can't be helped. We, we'll just have to give up." You're not going to solve the world's problems. You're not going to save the world. But you have to try. This is the story of 24 hours that changed lifetimes and the making of a record that rocked the world. One, two, Twenty years ago, the world was a very different place. So was the music scene. I was the singer in a band called Ultravox, and we were responsible for some pointy sideburns and some very dodgy facial hair. We were also responsible for bringing together electronics, cutting edge technology, and classic rock instrumentation to make a sound like nobody else could. Ultravox were a very big band. They were actually were very big in Europe and Australia. Um, they had a lot of hits, and they played heavy metal music with synthesizers. You know, they were a big draw, and I mean, Midge was hugely successful. Music is weaving. He was in one of those golden moments that artists get into, where everything you seem to touch just turns to gold. Pop stars, we were the biggest celebrities of our day. And 1984 was a year most of us will never forget. The wild boys are calling on their way back from the fire. You could compare 1984 to, let's say, 1968 in the 60s, and it was a like the pivotal year with everything rotated around 1984 in the 80s. House music, dance music. Quite a changing point, I think culturally as well. It was an era of complete contrast. Obviously, it was the Thatcher era. Strikes and the period of immense greed and no one really cared about anybody else. But it was a, it was a period of change and a period of goodwill as well. It was a fabulous time to be involved in. Everything was larger than life. The clothes we wore, the, the shoulder pads, the hairspray. It was all about excess, and um, which is why I think bands from the 80s never kind of transposed and, and found their way into the 90s very well, because it, the 90s became very street. <laughs> True was breaking through on the Billboard charts in America. We were just about to go out on uh, the biggest tour we'd ever taken part in. So. For me, I mean, I can only speak to my, for, about myself, but my feet had lost, had left the planet. And uh, 
I was doing things that I never thought I would do. You know, I was living out every schoolboy's dream. But now I've come back again. But one friend of mine wasn't quite so lucky. The silicon chip inside her head gets switched to overload. He was the lead singer of the Boomtown Rats and had once tasted the big time. Now his hits had started to dry up. For Bob Geldof, life wasn't quite so good. Tell me why I don't like Mondays, I want to shoot. Ooh, 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 ooh. The holiday down. I was trying to manage decline within myself and within the band. The manager had sort of exploded into uh, drug anger. We were alienated from our record company. We were alienated from the audience. How do you get that back? What would I end up doing in my life if the band gave up? I couldn't do it as a solo artist. I had really very little confidence in my sort of abilities. One cold night on the 23rd of October, 1984, Bob Geldof turned on the BBC News. His problems were put into perspective as he watched a groundbreaking news report by journalist Michael Burke from famine-struck Ethiopia. 15,000 children here now, suffering, confused, lost. Death is all around. A child or an adult dies every 20 minutes. I wanted to grab people by their lapels, you know, and shake them and say, look at this, look at this. I'm not going to tell you how to feel, but look at it. The overriding desire was that people at the end of the day couldn't say that they didn't know. And I think that's all a reporter can actually aspire to. They found this young girl. She was a nurse, and she had to pick from a mass of emaciated figures, 300 people that would live, because that's all the food she had to give them. It breaks my heart, but at least I can see some of the ones that I am helping here, and that helps when you do see the ones that survive. That meant she wasn't picking 300 little for life. She was choosing 5,000 for death. And I was just startled by it. Uh, any sort of notions of records and sales and career and crap uh, like that just disappeared. demanded a response and I thought I know I'll write a song the rats can do it and of course immediately what's the point that we can't even you know get a really good song going you know I mean this 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 single is crapping out what price a charity thing I missed Michael Buck's report because I was appearing on the tube a cult music show presented by Paula Yates Bob's partner at the time Welcome to another fantabulous edition of the Tube. After the show, I dropped by her dressing room for a chat. She was on the phone to Bob. The phone was then handed to me. Little did we know that that conversation was going to change ours and thousands of other lives forever. Our big idea was to make a Christmas pop song to raise money for the famine victims of Ethiopia. Bob wanted me to be the record's producer. If you're at the top, you can ask anybody to do anything and they'll do it. If you're kind of dropping down, you have to, you, you have, to have a little bit extra. You have to bring something to the party, to the record with you. And I think Bob realised that he had to have Midge on board. And once he had Midge on board, all Bob's friends who know his musical limitations would think, OK, we know the record will get made now, so it's not going to embarrass us. Only days after Michael Burke's news report, Bob came over to my place. On the way, he scribbled a few lyrics down on the back of a taxi. 
He was clearly still busking it when he tried out his ideas on me. So, um, give us a demonstration of what I was subjected to that day. Well, um, yeah, I mean, this is a good guitar with six complete strings. And, it's mine. and it was in tune. And I didn't know the words, so I would have been sort of not singing into the mic. I would have been looking down at my notebook. And, well, it's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid. It's Christmas time. And there's no need to be afraid. It was kind of like Bob Dylan on Librium. Yeah. And then I mumbled. I'd have just, just, just gone. I would have been making it up, trying to do something. I'd have probably put in a D minor, trying to make it vaguely interesting. <laughs> and then the, and the lyrics are, and there won't be snow in Africa this Christmas time. I'd have done that, you know, I'd have been groping towards it. Now, um, pretty much the way I write songs still, you know. <laughs> Most records take months to make. If ours was going to be out in time for Christmas, we'd have to work our little backsides off. What's wrong with that guitar? Uh, it's Fender, it's not a Japanese copy. It's not a Japanese <laughs> copy, it'd be in tune. Also no. <laughs> we had managed to wangle some free studio time, only four weeks away, so the pressure was on. Armed with Bob's sketchy lyrics and my own ideas, I began knocking the song into shape. I went home, sat down with my little Casio keyboard on my kitchen table and came up with what I thought was a really Christmassy tune, this. But having heard Bob's really dark lyrics, I thought, is it going to work? And I was left with a hideous job of gluing these two totally incompatible pieces of music together. It's Christmas time and There's no need to be afraid Time. Midge was perfect. He can just sit down on a keyboard or a guitar and get it together very, very quickly. Bob's strength was always words, and that's how it all bedded down in the end. This is a 50-50 split, and I think that's about as fair as it gets. The Boomtown Rats were signed to Phonogram, and somehow Bob managed to persuade them to distribute the record for free. For the records of any chance of success, Bob needed to get the biggest pop stars together in the studio. He'd shuffle in, and he was always such a scruff, you know. In he'd go, on the phone, and he'd sort of, he was always hunched up, and you could hear, and then occasionally you'd hear some stream of expletives that was very clear, and then it'd be back to his, I'd slam the phone, OK, I've got him, basically ticking off famous people who he'd got. I thought he was ringing up to say, you know, uh, I, li I like your album. But no, he told me the album was shite. But, uh, but despite that fact, would I like to be part of his song? Just completely cut every single corner that could be cut of the bullshit of the conversation. Like, how are you? Having a nice day? No, forget it. Phil, I need a famous drummer. And uh, that I've never forgotten because, you know, he, he didn't sort of have any, didn't have any qualms about whether I was good or not. He just wanted someone that was famous. <laughs> When Bob was on a mission, there was no stopping him. He wasn't just calling people up, he was physically collaring stars in the street. I was in the King's Road, which is just around the corner from where Bob lives, in an antique shop. And the guy who owns this place was, was taking me up into the window and I, and I was standing looking up and I heard this rat-tat on the glass and turned around and his big face was pressed up against the glass. And he was going like, well, you know, like that at the thing. He's, and he said, come in, come in. So I went in and he said, what are you doing? Suddenly I was ignoring the art and the antiques and listening to Bob. And he said, did you see the Michael Burke documentary? And I said, I hadn't. And, and I could see he was very moved by what he'd seen. And sort of angry as well and frustrated. And he says, something we can do. We had no idea if these artists were going to show up on the day. So I decided to play it safe. I called a select few into my studio to lay down their parts onto tape. I 
I was rummaging through my uh, tape box in my studio the other day and I found a 20 year old cassette of the very, very beginning of the recording of uh, Do They Know It's Christmas. And there are only two artists singing it. One, me, singing it very badly, a very bad guide vocal. And this artist that we've come over to America to come and see. Sting is here in the US on his successful Sacred Love tour. Even back in 1984, he was a big star. And I was flattered when he came down to record these harmonies in my studio. I can't wait to see his face when I play on the tape. Oh, here we go. <laughs> At this point, we're the only people that were on it. Mm -hmm. Remember that one? Oh, let's, hear the, let's hear the chorus, come on. Oh, uh, wow. Well, uh... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there was some. There's a charming naivety about this song, and I think a more sophisticated song wouldn't have worked. It had to be a kind of Christmas carol, nursery rhyme, simple, idealistic vision, and that's exactly what it was. A week to go, most of the biggest pop stars in the UK had committed, and the song was underway. But we didn't yet have an image for the record sleeve. Bob approached an artist who had created the iconic sleeve for the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album. Although the artwork had to be ready in a couple of days, Peter Blake took up the challenge. The music was a sing-along, kind of lilting, um, anthem really um with with a, with an undercurrent of darkness which is what i tried to do visually for the cover you've got this over christmasy image and then you you've got this rather kind of victorian father and the the children father christmas coming a christmas tree and in the same space in the same room are the children from ethiopia they're not aware of it which is, do they know it's Christmas? And these children aren't aware of the Ethiopian children. In just two days, Peter Blake had created another classic pop record sleeve, which would become a great collector's item. Sarn Studios in Notting Hill. This is where we recorded our song, Do They Know It's Christmas? It once belonged to Island Records, and Bob Marley had a flat here. The studio donated just 24 hours to record and mix the record. It normally takes weeks for artists to fine hone their craft. This was going to be a huge challenge. <laughs> we were standing right here waiting nervously for people to arrive. It was 20 years ago. Sunday morning, the 25th of November, 1984. I would have been here. Fairly ill. I would have, I'm sure I was here about eight o'clock in the morning. So no other bands had come in. Nobody. We were standing out here, like this, with a sea of cameras stuck in our faces from the world's media, and we weren't actually sure who was going to turn up. How many people do you think all together are going to be working on? The cameras had arrived in anticipation of a big event, but as yet, no stars. We needn't have worried. Bob's persuasive powers had paid off. From 10 a.m., a collection of massively successful pop stars on the Sunday off started showing up. Here was the entire roster of the top 80s bands in one place. Most of them looked like they had just got out of bed. It was a bit like going to scout camp. It was like seeing pop stars unplugged, stripped, you know, bare, first thing in the morning, sleep in their eyes. Great. We were in Germany the night before with the Drannies. And I remember we had a right night out. And we looked terrible. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a group, so they, they invited us all along. 
And it was like, you've never seen ten puffy pop stars rushing for a toilet as quick as the Durannies and the Spandars. And it was like hairspray out, you know, Nick Rhodes getting the makeup on. In came Sting with a newspaper under his arm. He got out of the limo. The glimmo was round the corner, but he made out he was walking round the corner. So. Banana Rama arrived in the studio manager's old golf. Just saw so many famous people there, and we were just like shocked at uh, the, the scale of the thing. Had no idea at all. It was just cameras clicking and films going, and dressed so appallingly. And I just looked horrendous. We looked scrappy, but we always looked scrappy. But we always put our faces on. <laughs> That was definitely our look. Yours was just particularly Mine was particularly poor that day. (laughs) (laughs) To be honest, we didn't really have a clue where we were going. We knew we were going to make this charity record, but we didn't really see the importance of that day. I think most people that were involved in the record didn't at the time. By 11am, over 30 of the biggest artists of the 80s had arrived at the studio. But someone was missing. Boy George was a big star of 1984. The year before, the song Karma Chameleon had rocketed his band Culture Club into the big league. He was also well known as one of the first openly gay pop stars. Now, he was notable by his absence. I sort of gone to bed about four in the morning and somebody woke me up. <laughs> Hello, George. Are you awake? I got his number in a hotel, I don't know where, in New York, and uh, he ran and said, where are you? Sort of like father or dad, you know? There was this kind of mad Irish voice kind of ranting down the phone at me. And I was like, can you stop a minute? Who is this? And I said, it's Gallop, where are you? And he goes, he goes, I'm in New York. He said, I've just woken up. I said, get on a plane. You know, it's just like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, OK, OK, well, you know. And he said, is it today? And I said, yeah. And I said, there's a Concord at whatever, one o'clock. I said, get up, get on it. OK, and then I, I went back to sleep and I sort of woke up in the morning and I thought, did that happen? The morning Concord left New York in time, but Boy George wasn't on it. He was still in bed. <laughs> Meanwhile, the stars gathering in the studio floor were waiting nervously to sing their parts. Nobody had a clue what the day would bring. Most hadn't even heard the song. It was a strange and motley crew of people gathered. You know, at first you could think, well, do these people really know what's going on in Africa all that far away? And then you realised, you know, it doesn't really matter. Whatever reasons that we were all there, and probably all of us corrupt in some sense, you know, you wouldn't want to be in a band if you didn't want to be in front of a camera. We were kind of meeting for the first time. I suppose there's that little bit of trepidation because you're all... There's a little bit of competition that goes on, but after a little while, the guard goes down and everybody's fine. I didn't actually know it was going to be quite such a big do. I didn't know quite so many people were coming, but the more the better, obviously. It's been a great idea from Bob and Midge, and I think, and obviously, like the cause is, you know, the money that, that is where it's going to, and that's a good, it's a great idea as well. It's great for the charity thing, obviously, but it's almost like become a, like a celebration of British problems. You know, it's everybody and, and together, it's great. I think it's going to be very interesting. You know, all these egos together in one room. Very funny. <laughs> <laughs> On the day in the lineup, we had two legends of the rock scene. Aging rockers then, but still working today, Rick and Francis from Status Quo. What a couple they are. We 
still felt we felt kind of yeah really. nerve wracking, and we weren't we felt out of that. They were like all those new bands that saw us at the time, all new young bands, and uh, we re I really did feel like um, we were past it, I suppose. I, mean, I went to bed and I went to sleep, and I feel like four sacks of shit today, actually. Five sacks is, is dead, and like two is uh, quite a bad hangover. Four sacks of shit is feeling pretty rough. And uh, that's pretty much how I was feeling, yeah, on the day, because, I mean, you know, it was, it was all going off. Mm. And uh, there were hangovers, terrible hangovers. Not the best way to go in feeling, so the only way to, to start feeling better is to get wrecked again. <laughs> and that's, ex worse. that's exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> By noon, everyone, except, of course, Boy George, had arrived. With his keen eye for publicity, Bob had organised a group photo call to make the early editions of the press, hoping this would pay off. So make sure you can see the cameras as well. <laughs> You look at the group shot now, and it looks like a kind of German football team sporting a various collection of mullets. All right, OK, we're all in. I think George Michael won on the big hair front. Closely followed by John Taylor. There was just so much lacquer going on in the room. You know, it was, it was a fire hazard. There was a real frisson of energy. You know, who would just sit at the back and giggle? Status quo was certainly the, the naughty schoolboys in the back. And there was that kind of people falling into the hierarchy of school. You know, Sting, without any doubt, was the head boy. I'm a, I'm a school teacher and the elder brother. I sort of carry that demeanor into normal life. That's just me. It's boring, but I can't help it. I quite enjoyed being the only girl in that situation, I think. Yeah, big fat faces at the time <laughs> we both had. John! I to the camera! It's just the way things were back then. I mean, there were far fewer women in the charts and women artists around. I mean, I'm quite tall. I'm six foot three and a bit. But, I mean, I got stood, I think I was stood next to Tony Hadley. And he's a bloody giant, isn't he? <laughs> That's huge. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> so I was kind of like, trying to get away from him. I was one of the small guys right down the front here. <laughs> oh, that, who's that guy there? Oh, it's that Midge guy. <laughs> Jodie Watley. So I was looking at her derriere. I'm not really a derriere person, but I was that thing. <laughs> and I was staring at her derriere, and of course the camera got me. <laughs> Can you begin to imagine just how petrifying it was for these poor singers who've all just uh, gotten up out of bed or not been to bed, uh, got off a plane, it's Sunday morning, the croaky voice, a little hungover, and it's their turn to come in and sing a song that they've only heard a couple of times. Um, we had to pick a poor victim, and the first victim was Tony Hadley from Spandau Ballet. <laughs> I was the one that got pointed at. <laughs> and you know, you can't lose face in front of all your mates. Because it's scary. I mean, I know, you know, so you get paid to sing, that's your job, you should be pretty good at it. But when you've got your fellow musicians up there all looking down at you, all thinking, I can cry that I'm not the one who went, is down there, do you know what I mean? Where the only water flowing is the bitter sting of tears. Okay, hi. Christmas bell. Yep, it's getting better. Once, twice, the second one was a take. That was it. Okay. And in our world. Okay, try it again. Oh. Oh. Vocal out. We recorded each artist's vocals separately so we could mix the tracks together to make the song. Tony Hadley went first, but the opening lines were sung later by another top vocalist of the time. At Christmas time. We let in light and vanish shade. Gosh, you're good, aren't you? Sounds like sure, you're right. <laughs> The first line was supposed to be for David Bowie, and I could hear David Bowie doing that. There's no need to be afraid, um, the way he does. And uh, as I was the only other person in the room that could sing somewhere down there, I think that's why I got the part. It's Christmas time. 
And there's no need to be a great that At Christmas time it if he we let in light and vanish yeah. The first two are great. I think there could be just a little bit more expression, you know, just let it open, you know. At Christmas time, we let in line, we banish shade. Yeah. Bob kept singing his version of the song, which is nothing like the melody at all. It might be like the melody that Bob sang when he came to me in the first place, but it certainly wasn't the melody on tape. And I cracked, I just thought, Jesus, I was running out of time, the pressure was on. I said, Bob, enough. Yeah, I think so, I think it's too, I think it's too bland now. One singer, one song. Do you want to do the line again and just sing it how you feel, yeah. Paul? Here's to you. I couldn't pitch the note at all. And that lovely moment where somebody had to say to me, Rick, uh, we, <laughs> I think it's probably best that somebody else sings your bit. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Do they know it's Christmas time at all? You get the melody part, you get the da 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 and then you're straight in. Here's to you. And then he sings. Right, so we'll have his goo, 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 goo vocal. Mm. Here's to what you Don't sing. do that, it hurts. <laughs> 15 years. What a pain in the ass. That's good, though. <laughs> Phil Collins played drums on the day. I thought that his first take was brilliant. But being a perfectionist, he asked for another. And that was even better. My, my immediate feeling with anything like that is like, you know, I hope this is going to be okay, I hope I'm not going to embarrass myself, you know, I feel very insecure, those kind of things. Because these were all the hip cats at the time. And they were kind of, let's see if this guy really is as good as I have heard he is, you know, and it was like very intimidating. You know? That's perfect. You know, I, I kind of, I felt I didn't really want to take up too much time. Because <laughs> got to go on with the more important things, you know. And there won't be snow in Africa this Christmas time. Totally different melody, but there was no good. There was a sense of jeopardy. Are we all going to just look like prats here? You know, some of us were better at that than others, but it was. It, we, we, everyone put that outside the door, and there was a sense after a while that we were here for other people, people we may never meet or know, but we were here for them, and. Egos had to be put aside. There's a world outside your window. Um, you know what? I need, uh, if you can take Midge out, just after, like, the first, la first line, um, the echo's a bit heavy and the vocal's a bit low. So actually, I had Sting standing next to me when I recorded my bit. And rather than make me feel nervous and uncomfortable, I, I took great kind of comfort from that. I was very proud to be uh, on the microphone next to Sting. I really was. It's hard, but when you're having fun... I always in for a punt, you know, so I thought, well, even if it's terrible, it doesn't matter. I sort of came down and sang it and enjoyed singing it. I, d I didn't think it would get that far. There's no world outside your window And it's a world of dread and fear Twenty years on, and my engineer Rick Walton and I dug out the master tapes from the recording to hear the voices from the past again. In doing so, we rediscovered the last-minute changes we made on the day. And the Christmas bells that ring there the Different melody. There's only fate. See, that's, that's the original. No, we dropped in on it afterwards. That's the, that's the line that I changed. Well, we changed it from, and tonight, thank God, it's them instead of you, because I think I think there was a huge bone of contention about well, it. I, was I had worried. a problem with it. Yeah. You were worried about it, and I know Bono was worried about it, right. and eventually sang the line. I said, please don't ask me to sing that line tonight, thank God. Um, it's them instead of you. I just I just don't think I can sing that. And no. He didn't like that at all, you know. He thought it was very raw and crude and not what I wanted to say, because that's what he said. He said, are you sure that's what you want to say? It seemed like the most bitterly selfish line 
Um, and I think maybe it was the truth of it that, that unnerved me about it. I did, almost didn't want to admit to it. It is happening. There's no point pretending or wishing it was otherwise. That's why we're here, you know. And what makes me respond is when I look at my kid and just say, thank God, you know. And that's the response. That's why we're going to help, because this shouldn't happen to anyone. I have to admit, even I um, get the shivers um, when I hear it. Well, tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. That's great. That's, that's sounded That's really right. good. Why mm. just check that? Yeah. Six p.m. and guess who swanned in? Boy Simon. Boy George had managed to catch the last concord of the day. Fuck me! He wanders in at six in the evening. Yeah, I, I'm weird. You know. I remember sort of getting out of my car and walking straight into the studio, and the first person I encountered was Simon de Bond from Duran Duran. And we'd been, like, sworn enemies, you know, for many years, but we ended up kind of putting our arms around each other and posing for the press. I didn't actually think he was going to turn up. He did turn up in a sort of flurry, and, hi, everyone, I've arrived. And I remember, um, he's not going to forgive me for this, George, but it's true. I remember George saying, I need a drink. And Bob said, there's a fucking pub across the road, you that's a bleep, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> Which was um, really good, and then George immediately got it. All power to him. And then he sung like a bird, of course. The greatest gift they'll get this year... Stop, I know what to do. I found the plot. My voice was um, quite sore. I think I drank a lot of whiskey and stuff. <laughs> I thought I was just going there and do a Rod Stewart, you know, get really drunk and have a, have a sort of raspy voice, but it worked for the track, you know, so it was just one of those things that fell into place, really. And in our world of plenty, we can spread a smile of joy. Throw your arms around the world at Christmas time. I think I was a bit, I wasn't sure if it was any good, and uh, Bob said something really sweet to me. Something like he said, oh, you sound like an old black lady. And I said, oh, well, that's good then. <laughs> <laughs> My next to Alf, or is it Paul Young next? No, it was Paul Young first. So Alf's right. next. <laughs> no, it wasn't Alf. That wasn't Alf. That was, was that? George Michael. God, it's only camp. But then he is. <laughs> I just remember that was a big recurring theme in his interviews at the time. He was always trying to out all the other pop stars. And he thought most pop stars were gay anyway. Um, but he particularly used to have a thing for George Michael, and you know, hey, he was he was on the money. If we if we uh, if you wanted to kind of change the notation a little bit, so it started off a bit higher or something. But say a, but say a prayer. I could do that if you want. Wake me up it was 7 p.m. and now the work was done for the vocalist. I was aware there was a party atmosphere outside the control room. But despite this being a celebrity fest, the whole setup was remarkably low key. There wasn't really much food or drink or anything like that, but people were just kind of making do. You know, it was just sort of a bit bombshell to me, really, I suppose. <laughs> sort of glamorous bombshell to the pop stars. One, two, three, four, be the A highlight of the day was something that really made the song. Feed the world. Having everyone sing Feed the World together at the end really gave the song its magic. The world. Let them know it's Christmas time again. I used to be in a church choir, and, um, and when it came to singing the chorus, it was the first time since I'd sung with a big choir that I was standing in a group of that many people who were really giving it all they could and really trying to sound good and not just trying to look good for the cameras, you know. It was, it was, really, it was something very special. Well, I was just miming, I think. Up until what, probably 24 hours, maybe 48 hours prior to doing this, we hadn't written this bit, mm -hmm. which is the main kind of hook of the record, yeah. which is mad. Let them know it's Christmas time again. 
We'd recorded the vocals, but it wasn't over yet. The 24 hours we'd been given were running out, and I was feeling the strain. We would have to stay up all night mixing the song to get it ready for the pressing plants the next morning. If we didn't, the record wouldn't make it into the shops in time for Christmas. It was very early morning, the record was finished. Um, we all had very gritty eyes, very tired, very irritable. Um, I left never, ever wanting to hear that record again. As I was leaving the studio, the Daily Mirror printing presses were running with our story on the front page. We had made it. It was unheard of at that time to have a music story as the lead item. We were already making history. That morning, Bob went straight to the Radio One breakfast show, where the song was about to be played on air for the first time. Everybody had worked on the record for free, from the artists in the record company to the retailers who were going to sell it in the shops. Now Bob made a pledge to the nation. I'm really tired now. You know, we've both been up all night. It doesn't matter whether you like this song or not. And I swear to you, every penny, every penny from this record will go to someone who needs it. <laughs> In the days that followed, the record received continuous airplay. Band-Aid, do they know it's Christmas time? Bob and I even managed to persuade one of our idols, the rock god David Bowie, to launch the Band-Aid video on television that week. It would be wonderful if you could all buy copies of this record. You know that the money will go to the Ethiopians. That's the seal of approval for the rock community. Bowie says it's cool. Must be then, you know, it doesn't get much cooler than Bowie. Because of time pressure, the video was made from the footage recorded in the day. But it worked. And now everyone could see who had sung each line. Within days, the buzz was huge. We had a runaway success on our hands. Band-Aid went straight to number one. Yes, it's number one as of the one... The is selling here faster than the makers can press... Sold a million in a week. It's become the fastest selling single ever. We definitely thought it would go in at number one and it'd be the biggest record that week, but the extent of its success. I mean, the stories that were appearing in the papers, you know, people going into stores and buying 50 copies, just incredible. Butchers in Plymouth, I believe, you know, you had the goose, the turkey, the pork for Christmas, and a row of Band-Aid records in the shop window. Fortnum and Masons rang me and said, how does one go about selling record discs? In total, Band-Aid sold over three million copies in the UK eventually raising £8 million worldwide. Its success was to change Bob's life forever. Bob Geldof is back in the room. By a meeting with Mother Teresa. Bob Geldof, winner of a newspaper award. Bob Geldof in Ethiopia. Bob Geldof denied report. Everything in the Band-Aid garden was wonderful and rosy. So we thought. Except for Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative government, who wanted to charge VAT on the record. Bearing in mind that 
All of this stuff was all done for free to that point. The Treasury has once again emphasised that VAT must be paid on Band-Aid's charity record for Ethiopia. I think they're mean. It means if they waive it on that, they've got to waive it on so much else. That money should be allocated to famine relief. We had a bit of a problem with the VAT on the record. I know, so, uh, but you know, don't forget, we've used some of your VAT with the, to, to give back and to plough back. Mm. We've given again and again. I mean, a government has to get taxation from somewhere. People so, remember it's a taxi driver. Oh, when you tell Thatcher, you know, you were the only one who told her to fuck off. And I didn't. I actually towered over her, but I didn't do that on purpose. It was because the cameras were pressing us, and I'm looking down at her. I mean, at the moment, you've got a problem with the uh, butter mount, and you don't know how to dispose of it to sell to the Russians is the cheapest yes, but way. I'm sorry, but butter doesn't do very much good no, in Africa, no, as you know. Well, butter, it's oil, butter oil actually does. It is one of the major uh, supplementary foods. Butter oil, if you, can, if you can get it. Uh, I could see she was turning to go. And being me, I had to get the last word, and she said, it's, you know, she said, it's not as simple as that. And I said, no, Prime Minister, nothing as simple as dying, really. But don't the Prime forget, Minister, there are millions a... dying, and yes. that's the terrible thing. Yes, indeed. Difficult to tell who was lecturing who. Under this much pressure, the government caved in quietly, handing the VAT back to the Band-Aid Trust in the form of a donation. It was this rock and roll, gung ho attitude that made everything happen. We just wouldn't take no for an answer. So there we were, making history, and we really didn't know what we were doing. In the middle of Thatcherism, Band Aid came along and made people aware. It also made charities incredibly cool. Young people were getting more and more involved in charitable causes. Something had changed. At the height of the 1980s, Band-Aid reconnected rock stars with their consciences. It also opened up a floodgate for a, an entire onslaught of charity records featuring pop stars singing in a chorus of concern. This soon became the industry standard, using celebrity, the very powerful force of celebrity, for good causes. And you remember me when the west wind moves upon the fields above. If the rainforest dies, then my country is in danger. This is the way I feel that I pay for my citizenship, by using my fame whenever I can to transmit an idea. Band-Aid forever linked charity to celebrity. It's perhaps unfortunate but true that if you want to get your cause well known, you need a famous face to promote it. So. It's about it as far as this film goes. All these people need is money. How you get it doesn't matter, as long as it doesn't involve taking it away or killing someone else, you know. If the way you do it is making a song, dying your hair grey, wearing a silly shirt, then so be it. It's not harming anybody. Thank you very much. Band-Aid changed my life because it started me on a journey to discover this continent next door and the people who live in it and our complicity in their, in some of their problems. You two's Bonner, looking at the best ways of helping impoverished countries. I think it was a turning point for the 80s, actually, because it was so me, me, me before that, and it suddenly people had a conscience, I think. It actually changed in a way, I think it changed the direction of music. It became a lot more um, introspective, I guess. It's Christmas time. To be afraid at Christmas time, we let it light and we banish shame. When I hear the song every year at Christmas, I feel a certain distance. It's almost as if it doesn't belong to us anymore, it belongs to everybody. It's become more than a song, it's almost a hymn for our time. It's just there, like Silent Night, like, like you know, Come On Ye Faithful. It's just Christmas. It's just there. At Christmas time, it's hard, but when you're having fun, there's a world outside your window. The weird thing about the song is that it's very uplifting, and we are trying to deal with a subject that's tragic and horrifying. But I think we all knew that 
there had to be the element of camaraderie and um, euphoria, paradoxically, to sell the record. song. It was complete bollocks, actually. I mean, first of all, they didn't know it was Christmas because it wasn't Christmas in Ethiopia. They got a different calendar. <laughs> Christmas in Ethiopia is in, I don't know, the middle of January or something. So, you know, I mean, you can easily pick holes in it, but it didn't matter, did it? It caught the mood. Those faces, those personalities, those musical talents made saving um, the lives of Africans cool. In March 1985, I went out with the first band-aid shipment of food and medical supplies. As a humble musician, I quickly had to get my head round the values of things like high-protein biscuits and sorghum. It was a steep learning curve, and I realised then that this was going to be a long-term project. <laughs> more can be done, a lot more can be done. Twenty years on, and I'm back. If I thought for a second that I was going to be subjected to what I saw the first time I was here, uh, emaciated kids in camps and people dying, I don't think I could have done it. There's one thing seeing those things on television where you can turn it off and walk away. But when you're there, you can't. It's the taste, the smell, the whole thing is there. I admire people who live with that on a daily basis. I admire Bob for coming back many times. I couldn't. I'm here to see something much more positive. I'm here to see Band-Aid's legacy. Ethiopia's northern highlands are beautiful and remind me of the highlands back home. This is Coram, the area where Michael Burt filmed those horrifying images 20 years ago. Back then, it was a sea of people in makeshift tents. Now, it's a sea of green. This road didn't exist at the time. Something that our efforts in that studio all those years ago helped to change. What is this? It's a grain, another grain? It's a traditional grain store. Right, OK. I have come to meet some of the famine survivors to see how they live today. That, is that like oil or something? No, no, no it's a coffee. Coffee, coffee to yeah, right, coffee. Cook yeah. it right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. The kids here are fabulous. They make me hopeful for the future. My name is Little. My name is Abu. My name is Sika. My name is Kiran. We have to now face facts and realize that Band-Aid was, outside of what it started, just that, a Band-Aid. What's underneath that is the gaping wound of inequality between us living in the North and those living in the South. I have seen for myself the difference that our song made the first time round. But sadly, it was never going to be enough. The challenges in Africa remain huge. But hopefully, once again, our song will save lives. Fourteenth of November, 2004, Air Studios in Hampstead. This time, I'm the executive producer of Band-Aid 20. A new recording of the song for the 21st century.
to be doing this 20 years on, something I never ever expected. It's great on these young guys here, this whole different generation of people putting their talents and their efforts into it. Maybe every generation should have a version of this song and just keep the whole thing going. Definitely new, it's got a fresh, fresh and very now vibe to it, you know. It's definitely um, different from, from the first time round. The, the contributions that people have made, you know, you can really hear Paul McCartney's bass playing and Tom York's piano playing, and you can hear lots of things that uh, you wouldn't have heard 20 years ago. Right, we're going to stay where we are for a couple of minutes. It's such a momentous occasion, and I was the same age as my daughter is as well. <laughs> you know, my daughter is when it was originally recorded, so, you know, I just think it's absolutely fantastic. The last single sold three and a half million, and we should, I mean, we should at least double that, if not more. I see absolutely no reason why we shouldn't. And standing there in front of that sea of talent, those brilliant singers, and seeing their happy smiling faces as they gave it their all was wonderful. I'm just privileged. I'm a lucky guy. You know, I'm still not convinced it's a good song. I think both Bob and I have written much, much better things. But it's probably the thing we'll be remembered for most, a kind of musical epitaph in a way. Every time I hear the opening bars of that tune, it uh, takes me straight back to the day it was recorded. The magic comes from what it stood for. It did its job. It's Christmas time and There's no need to be afraid At Christmas time We let in light and banish shade And in our world of plenty we can spread a smile of joy Throw your arms around the world At Christmas time But say a prayer Pray for the other ones At Christmas time It's hard, but when you're having fun There's a world outside it's a world of dread and fear Where the only water flowing is The bitter sting of tears And the Christmas bells that ring there Are the clanging chimes of doom Do they know it's Christmas time at all? 